lessons of life, I would call this uh, concept. I try to look at different things that happen throughout history, that happen, how things work, what things don't work, and then try to apply it to our lives and to apply it to Judaism. So today I want to talk to you about why the United States haven't won a war since World War II. Interesting, right? So what do you think is that? No. They, they lost the underdog. They used to be the underdog, so they used to No, America was never the underdog. Let me let me tell you why I think that happens. So let's see exactly how things were handled. The United States is a mighty power. And I have to tell you, being a military person for a long time, that they have some amazing people. The, the core personnel of the United States in terms of the quality of its people it's just unbelievable. I mean, in all branches of the military. I mean, in all branches of the military. And there are many reasons. There's not only one reason why the United States haven't won a war. I mean, to name a few, things became political. They politicized the army. They tied the army's hands behind the back. For good reasons sometimes, but, you know, it turns out to be bad reasons. But I'm looking for something that is a little bit more under the surface than out, out in the open. Everybody could say that the whole procedures of opening fire, you know, really limits the soldiers and so on and so forth. Uh, the over-consciousness of, of American soldiers, and to, to that effect Israeli soldiers as well, not to affect civilian lives is also sometimes cost us in American lives. But, you know, of course, war is war, and you have to understand that civilians, you cannot target civilians, but you cannot expect zero civilian casualties, because war is war. So there are many reasons like this. I think, again, politicizing the, the military is horrific. But I think the underlining is not actually in politics, but the things in the way the army is being uh, handling itself, or whoever decides those things. So look at World War II. It's the last known victory of American for forces. I mean victory, I mean victory throughout. I mean, look at the 70 years that we had since then, and it's like basically had, had anchored the American victory. Is... Something was fundamentally different. And what it was, was the length, I think, of deployment. Okay. Today, you go, you join the military, the armed forces, you know, whether it's the, uh, the Air Force, Marines, Navy, whatever that will be. And you go to deployment. Deployment is like three months to six months, something of that sort. Then then you've been shipped back to, to the States. And then they said, so they basically have almost like a three-prong rotation. So you have people that are on deployment, and then people that are resting, and people that are training. And those people, they come back from deployment, go to the back of the thing, they rest, and then they train, and then they get deployed, and so on and so forth. When they went to World War II, they were deployed for years. They were deployed for years. They were deployed for, you know, four years, five years, six years. Even after the war, the people still deployed. And that means that you need to, you need to commit. It's not that the American armed forces are not committed to victory. But in the way they're going, they cannot commit. They can't, they can't, they can't win. 
you were not going to be able to win if you're not going to commit. And in the Israeli army, it happened the same thing. The service used to be three years, and then slowly, slowly, it's been reduced to two and a half years. But today, with all this technology and all the things you need to do and to operate at a high level, you know, you will have to do a lot of shortcuts and a lot of bureaucrats and, and, and so on and so forth. And people say, well, there's no money in, you know, yes, because we, have, we have became very not efficient, especially in Israel. The army is very not efficient. To train a soldier today into a high level of, of operation, you know, even if it's an infantry, it will take you about two years. So by the time he's really fully functioned, he's, he's having his skills in, in weapons and so on and so forth, he has one more year and then he's out. So I, to my very insignificant opinion, I am not a military analyst. I think that the core of Israeli army should be, for example, when I say army in Israel, we mean the military, has to be more professionals. The people join the army as professionals with, you know, that's going to be their career. So they can stay there for 10, 12, 15 years. Not three years and then they're out. Because then they have to go all over the, uh, all over the globe to, to South America, or to go to Thailand or whatever in the world they go to. For example, if you become an Israeli pilot, a pilot in the Israeli Air Force, because it takes you 24 months to just prepare you to become a pilot, and then you go into a squadron and you're like, you know, and so on and so forth, you have to sign for seven years. Or the same thing if you're in submarines, you know, you, you have to sign for like seven years after that. Well, that's, I understand that. Now, if you look at the pilots, Israeli pilots are great. Because of that commitment to the job for seven years or so on and so forth. You don't want it? Not a problem. Don't become a pilot. Get out. So when the United States sends its people to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Vietnam, whatever it is, when there is not a commitment to stay there and we're not going back until we're finishing the job, it's always rotation, somebody always have to start again not from where you stop, because they have to start again from where you started. And we can't win wars like that. We can't win wars like that. Look what happened in, the, in, in Iraq. Iraq was probably on its way to being a true democracy. American forces pulled out completely, became a hotbed for, for Iran. Or should I say, I ran. What does it have to do with me in terms of my Torah world? It means that before you're going to do anything, you need to understand you need to commit to what you're doing. And I'm committing means I am not letting through and letting it go until I'm through, until I'm done. If I'm not going to finish it, I'm not going to start it. And even that I'm committed to, to finish it, I need to think very, very carefully, what am I willing to give up? What am I willing to sacrifice? You can't have it all. You need to give up something. You want something? Give up something. So, for example, when American forces are being thrown like, you know, like a policeman of the world here, there, and everywhere, without saying, listen, we, we need to give, let, this, let this happen by itself, America can never win a war. And on all the other stuff that we said before, and it's a recipe for failure. And there's some amazing people. I mean, just like amazing people. The more you know the professional soldiers, the more you appreciate you know, what they do and the discipline that they have and so on and so forth. But when you're acting like a big baby, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So, okay, how are you going to pay for this? I mean, that's like a credit card mentality. Oh, I want this, I'll just, I'll just swipe it, you know? Swipe on no swiping. When you're going to swipe it, you're not thinking about what you're going to pay. And before you know, you owe like you know fifty thousand dollars in your in your overdraft in a credit card. You can't pay for it. Okay, so I'm gonna move belly up. That's a loser mentality. No, no, one second. 
uh, I cannot really, I, I really want it, but no, I cannot do that. I will have to give up my argument and say, gas for a month to buy this thing. Uh, I'm not doing this. So as a, as a, as a, as a Jew, what am I willing to sacrifice to get my mission done? You will have to sacrifice something. I'm not saying give up on your interaction with the world. In other words, live in a cave and, you know, just... But you will have to give up something. You have to get up and say, okay, this I'm giving up because my mission is to do this. So both as individuals, as, in a, as a nation, are we giving an account? Is there some kind of like a, a planning committee, you know, whether for me as an individual or for us as a community? What are we willing to give up to do that? So, for example, if I see that I have, let's say, poor people in my neighborhood, what am I willing to give up for them? What am I willing to give up? And now, am I willing to give up my renovation for my new bathroom? Says, listen, you know, I'm gonna put tiles and like, you know, take a take a bath like a like a you know Roman emperor emperor. You know, and, and, and all these things. Well, people don't have food on the table. You know, no, I'm not going to do this. And that means that brings you to another thing. That brings you to the we before the me. If you don't have the we before the me, in any tier one or any kind of a, of a, of a, you know, of a unit, you're going to be kicked out. It doesn't make a difference how buff and strong and this you are. One of the, the, the no-nos, the red lines to get you out of a program is if you don't have the we before the me. So if you're a selfish brat, that's not going to happen. And you need to understand, you cannot go and win wars alone. You need people around you. You need your buddies. In the, in the SEALs, when they go to, the, to, the, to Hell Week or they go to BUDS, it, they, there's a concept that is called the swim buddy. Okay? Read it on any of those books that you read about Navy. So there's a swim buddy. So at the beginning, they, you, they, they want to, and they, they drive you crazy. What do they do? So, okay, you are, uh, you know, two and a quarter seconds uh, late. Okay, run to the ocean. So you, you run to the ocean. Then you go into the, they're going to let you go into the water. Then you're going to come back and say, well, you know, you left your swim buddy here. Go back into the ocean. And your swim buddy will go with you until you get it, until it becomes a habit that you would not move without your swim body attached to you. And there's the distance that it has to be done, that it has to be kept. It's this six feet away from each other. More than that, you failed, you're out. Do we have the we in front of the me or the me in front of the we? Do we have the we at all in our way of looking at life? Because you cannot win wars alone. You are dependent on your team going to fail. So you have your support system? No. Are you willing to commit? No. Are you willing to give up something? No. You fail. You fail. You want something? Not a problem. What are you willing to give up? How long are you willing to commit to us? Are you willing to commit until the work is done? Finished, you achieve your goal. You got your objective, yes? All right, let's see how we do it. No, don't even start. You need to develop this like, go for the throat kind of a thing. You know, I'm not letting go until it's done. You don't have it, don't start, don't start. Sit home and accept upon yourself that you are a loser and live with it. But don't live in a fantasy world that you're capable and able and you will do it. And then you, years go by and you still haven't done a thing. Because you never commit to anything and not willing to give up everything. You want everything. And you end up with nothing. You want something? Again, commitment and willingness to give up. And that's something that you need to internalize. That's, I do believe, in terms of the mentality is probably the, maybe the biggest contributor for the fact that America does not win wars.
they don't go for the kill. They don't go for the throat. They don't stop until they're done. They'll pull up in the middle. And unfortunately, we lose, we lose good people like this. Of course, there's another problem that those who come back and our veterans, we don't treat appropriately. We don't take care of them. But that's another problem. That's another issue. And that's something that we all do. We take the people that did for us so much that for them we can go to McDonald's or go whatever and eat pizza and live the life of idiots. But those people grind the dust and blood and sweat and tears. And then when they come back, we throw them away. That's we do as well as people. An ungratefulness of a society. And an ungratefulness of a society comes from ungrateful people. At least treat those people right. Don't treat them different. Don't give them extra, you know, but give them opportunities. Give them a chance. Take care of them if they're sick. We treat our VAs, our veterans, like we, tr we would treat uh, an escort service. You pay your dues, goodbye and good luck. I have nothing to do with you. And that's very sad. America should celebrate its veterans. America should appreciate their soldiers. And if you see one in the street, just go to him or her. You see somebody wearing a uniform, it doesn't make a difference if it's a National Guard or he's a, you know, Navy SEAL. Say, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. Stop being ungrateful and go for the kill. Have a great day.